Hey, good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are. We have several people joining us today. I know you're from all over the, the country, a few folks from overseas, I think. Um, thank you very, very much for joining me. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, when Amon Gearbach asked me what I wanted to talk about, I decided that, you know, I thought it'd be fun to sort of discuss some of the daily things that go on in the life of a uh, a dual certified prosthodontist and laboratory technician. And it's interesting because whenever I go lecture, people always ask me sort of, you know, hey, you, ha you have one foot in both sides of the profession. You know, is there little nuggets? Are there any pearls? What, I mean, what can you tell me? You know, what, what can I tell the dentist as a technician that I, I wish they knew? What can I tell the technicians as a specialist that I wish they knew? And now, I mean, we only have, you know, 45 minutes or something like that today. So I decided, you know, I, I just wanted to take a few select items. Um, and the, what I'm showing you guys today, these are some of my, maybe like five or six of my favorite things that I, I wish that everybody knew from both sides. One of the first things that I like to impress upon people is if you are a dentist, if you're a technician, the the best possible chance to help you look good. I really can't stress this enough that everything starts with the foundation. If you make errors in the beginning of the process, it is very difficult often, you know, at stage three, stage four, to start correcting the wrongs that were made or any of the mistakes that were made. You really have to start from the beginning and get it right from the beginning. And I know, you know, especially working with a company like Amon Gearbach, we are definitely deep into this age of digital dentistry. And I know that there are people on both sides of this debate about whether they're doing handmade, whether they're digital only. And the truth of the matter is, is that you have to be somewhere in the middle. I, I don't think that you can be entirely one or the other. I think you can get excellent results using digital technology. I think that you can get excellent results doing handmade. But from my personal daily practice, I, I couldn't be that black or white. It, it really is something in between. You know, and here was a case that I did. This was a few years ago, right? And this is a hybrid prosthesis. It's a, it's a bar that was fabricated and we're doing a digital design over the top of it to figure out where we're gonna put the teeth. And this was a highly compromised case because there's a shortened dental arch concept that we're applying here, right? And so we wanna make sure that these teeth fall in line of where that bar is. Um, but at the other end of it, even though this is highly digital, there's still an analog world here. I couldn't just separate the two and do just simply one or the other. And I love this quote by David Allen Coe that says, it is not the beauty of a building you should look at, it's the construction of the foundation that will stand the test of time. And that is 100% true, whether you're doing analog, whether you're doing digital, whatever it is that you're doing. And so for the dentists out there, your technician makes or breaks you, right? That's the same with my technicians that I work with. I can give them a wonderful impression to start with, but at the end of the day, they're the ones that are making me look good. So just you know, do them a favor, give them a high quality product, really stack the deck in their favor because they are gonna try to make you look good. Your patients have no idea like what goes into this world behind the scenes. All they know was, do you have a good personality? How was your chair side manner? Did your anesthesia hurt? And how does that final product look? And one of the ways you can help that final product look absolutely outstanding is by making a great impression in the beginning. And I'll tell you right now that virtually 100% of my full mouth cases to my single central crowns still start with an alginate impression. Now, talk to me five years from now, that might not be entirely the case, but today that is still the way that things are going. So stack the deck in their favor. One of the ways that I do that is, you know, people always see my impressions and they're like, gosh, how did you get these vestibules? How did you get such a deep vestibule? You know, or the technicians will ask me, Miles, like, what, what do I tell my docs? Like, I can't get them to get an adequate, they can't impress beyond, you know, a couple millimeters beyond the, the CEJ. Like, how do I help them? So this is to me very low hanging fruit. You can see in this 
photograph, this patient is holding an implant retractor. And I am not sure what company makes this. There's a lot of them that are out there. Um, you know, I'm not here to promote any one company over the other. And even though I speak for Almond Gearbox, even though I speak for multiple companies, I'll be the first to tell you products that work and products that don't. And this product works for me. These implant retractors probably run you about 85, 90 bucks. They're stainless steel. They can be autoclaved. But aside from, you know, in this case, what you see here using them for implant retractors or final impressions, they're really good for photography, which is something that I, you know, pride myself on and that I employ a lot in my daily routine and my communication with the laboratory. But you can see here in the photograph on the right, you can see just how much of the patient's vestibule is really exposed. So this acts like an extra set of hands for me when I want to keep the lips, when I want to keep all the saliva off of the implants, off of the teeth, off of those analogs that you see there, right? The, or the, sorry, not the analogs, my, my vault, the impression copings. Um, this really, really helps. You can use it with alginate impressions. You can use it when you're, I use this when I am scanning a case. This also helps to scan to help keep things nice and clean. And so the result, you know, this is a type 3 gypsum that I pour from my diagnostic test, but you can just see the level of detail. You can see that I've kept the cheeks off from the anterior dentition all the way to the posterior. And so when I am working on, say, a second molar for a patient, you can see that I've got five, six, seven millimeters of vestibular depth there that I can work with if I need to make a putty matrix, if I need to make a surgical guide. So these implant retractors for me are a really nice tool that many people don't know about. And I wish that I had known about them earlier on in my career. And it's something that I use now daily. I have probably five or six of these floating around my office at any one given time, using them for, for multiple things um, aside from just um, retractors for my final impressions. Tip number two. All right. So number two in the pearls, nuggets, just general wisdom. I think there, I think it's really, really important to understand the materials. There's no one size fits all. Um, you know, everybody, every time a new material comes out, whether it's a new high strength zirconia, whether it's some new, you know, material like ceramic material, like a lithium disilicate that spans that gap between beauty and strength, or at least that's what the advertisements will tell you, right? Everybody rushes to use that product. And then I'll tell you as a specialist, I end up putting out a lot of those fires when the things fail because there is no, there is no one material that can do it all, right? Each one comes with its pros and cons. And I think it's really critical to know those limitations. So I'm gonna show you a case. This is a case, I show this case all the time. It's like one of my favorite cases. This was a case I did with my very good friend. Um, he's an excellent ceramist. He's an even better, <laughs> <laughs> partner in crime for these cases that we're doing. Uh, many of you guys know Lucas Lamont. Um, I don't know if he's watching this right now. Probably not. He's probably actually at the bench working on one of my cases. I hope he is. Hope he's not taking a break. <laughs> um, so this is the case. This patient, this is how they presented. If you'll take note of the maxillary dentition, these are 15-year-old metal ceramic crowns. What happens when metal ceramic crowns, especially when they've got ceramic on the lingual what happens when those are adjusted by a coarse grit burr right you've essentially turned your patient into a, a human sander right so take a look at the mandibular dentition you can bet that that pattern that wear pattern fits like a jigsaw puzzle into the upper you know the maxillary lingual occlusion so over time this patient has steadily worn his mandibular dentition down when you take a look at here from the profile, it's actually beautiful in a very pathological sort of way, the way that you can see all of the inner workings of the tooth. You can see that there's the, um, the enamel dentin. You can even see the pulp starting to show through. And many people that see this ask, you know, gosh, isn't that painful? No, it's not because this has happened so glacially. It's happened over a period of a decade and a half. Patient actually doesn't feel much at all. And you can see, with 23 through 26, look where the CEJ is. You can see that the patient, these teeth have been slowly erupting over time. This is what we call compensatory eruption. Um, so when we approach a case like this, oftentimes we'll do a little bit of crown lengthening. If the patient doesn't want to do ortho to reposition those teeth, you know, usually they've got a wedding coming up in a month and they want their teeth to look good. We don't have time to do ortho. Many of these patients that are, you know, beyond the age of like 35, 
had braces one time are not willing to go back into them. So sometimes we have to do with surgery and with pros what we could have done with orthodontics. So long story short, this patient doesn't like his initial presentation. And now this is interesting. So take a look at this. I noticed that, and there was a another Facebook forum where somebody was talking about, you know, hey, asking a question, do we do, does anybody here do Emacs on second molars, right? Emacs is a lithium disilicate. And so again, this was in a CAD CAM user group. Um, so take a look at the second molar on the left. So this would be tooth number 18 if you're based in the US. Tooth number, what is that, like 37 if you're in Europe or elsewhere, right? It's intact. It's pretty much intact. It's not a pretty restoration, but it's intact. Now take a look at the first molar on the left side, right? Tooth number 19 or tooth number, was that 3.6 Europe? Notice it's fractured, right? And everybody thinks that the second, I don't know why, where we got this idea. Maybe they were taught in dental school that second molars take the brunt of the force. And it's actually not true. First molars take the most force. So when I was being examined, you know, by board members who are all board certified prosthodontists and been doing this for 35 years and know every single paper inside and out, you know, they asked me why I did gold, a full gold crown in the first molar, but I did all ceramic. I did a, a lithium disilicate crown on the second molar. And that's because the strength of bite force on the first molar is more than it is on the second molar, right? That's where the brunt of the bite force takes place. So it's interesting that that, I don't know, somehow that, that myth got perpetuated. And so again, you take a look at this patient in the profile view, this is a mirror shot. Look at that tooth. Look at that thing fractured, right? So a lot of folks out there think like, oh, teeth in an hour, right? So I get the teeth. When the teeth in an hour come back, this is what I see, right? This is <laughs> probably somebody's geographic success. You know, they did this case in Florida or something, and as far as they know, it worked out. But I, I saw the patient <laughs> a year later, and the tooth wasn't doing so great. Same with the premolar in front of it, the adjacent tooth, not doing so great. This quote by William Strauss is one of my favorite ones. And as soon as I saw this case, it made me think about this. It says, the skull is the creation of God, but the mandible is the work of the devil. And everybody out there, every technician, every dentist that's out there knows, I mean, our patients are put our restorations, put their own teeth through the ringer. They really put it through the, through the crucible. I mean, this stuff doesn't last forever. Um, and, you know, so we get patients like this. Um, and they've done a little bit of research online, and now this patient had metal ceramic crowns on top, so he thinks that that's what's done the damage to his natural dentition. He's had lithium disilicate crowns in the posterior place that fractured rapidly, so he thinks that that's junk. And so now the patient comes to me requesting zirconia, and I actually, I don't have any issue with zirconia for this case. But the problem with doing, you know, zirconia, some, zirconia has its own issues, but there are a lot of beneficial things. And so fortunately, in this case, I didn't have to say no to the patient. You know, one of the nice things about doing tooth preparations when we're going to restore with full contour zirconia is that you can keep the tooth preparations pretty minimal. Um, and when I do these full arch or full mouth rehabilitations, rejuvenations, whatever you want to call them, here was something else that I, I like to stress to you know many of the doctors and technicians that I work with is that I do the quadrants first. Um, I, I do or I do quadrants rather than full mouth. It's very rare that I'll prep 14 teeth and try to impress that all at once. That's a hell of a day. That's a lot of days. That's a lot of time with that patient's being in 14 temps. Um, you know, and stuff always goes wrong. Patients don't follow your instructions. They do whatever they they want to do. You know, you tell patients, hey, don't eat laffy taffy. Don't don't eat you know, a Snickers bar while, you, while you've got these things in. And then they come back with the temps out and you ask them why the temps are out. What were they eating? They tell you Swedish fish and you, <laughs> and you know, they say, you didn't tell me not to eat Swedish fish. And obviously you can't go through an entire exhaustive list of things not to eat, but patients don't listen. They have no idea. Right. So I try to keep this again, when I was in residency and we had to do our own full mouth rehabilitations, it was much easier for me to control if I just did six at a time. Right. So if I just did six at a time or four at a time for the quadrants, that was just much easier to me. And so I generally like my technicians. So I try not to put them through the same hazing process that I had to go through in the residency. So whenever possible, I try to restore just a sextant or a quadrant first. 
And if I'm doing it like that, I always restore the anterior first. So you can see here, I've restored the anterior. Now granted, this guy's got some of the posterior teeth in already, but this is, I'm using this obviously to show, <laughs> to illustrate a point. Um, you can see here with three shape design, we are restoring the lower left quadrant now. If you look over at the lower right in the anterior, you can see those, the anterior sections all already been complete. The posterior quadrants already been complete on the right. Now we're restoring the final four teeth. And honestly, it doesn't really take that much longer to do um, a case like this, and the patients don't mind. While they, once we've restored the posterior teeth, they're usually, um, they've got some composite, like I'll do a quick composite buildup on the posterior teeth to keep the occlusion, to maintain that occlusion. Um, and for this case here, we just did a monolithic stain and glaze technique. That's it. And a ton of credit to Lucas on this case. Um, when we were cutting off the existing crowns that this patient had on tooth number 30, or I guess that would be 4-6, again, for the, our European colleagues and friends who are joining us, that tooth um, had an existing crown, and the resulting ferrule that was under that was really shallow. And I didn't want to do a root canal on that to try to, you know, build up the crown, and I didn't want to just throw some composite on there to build it up because it wouldn't really stick. But his premolar was quite tall, so we decided, um, you know, since we were doing zirconia for this, that we weren't going to be able to bond it, that I wanted to keep it splinted. The patient, the, post, the maxillary dentition was already splinted, so this patient, you know, owns stock and super floss already, and he understands, you know, the benefits of flossing underneath the restoration and not between it. So we thought that this would be really good. But again, all credit to Lucas for making this really not look like a bridge. This looks like two completely individual teeth. So these are all monolithic full contour uh, restorations. And you can see from where we started to where we finished. We bumped up the value a little bit, made these things look a little bit nicer. Um, and again, for most patients, anybody looking at this, any dentist, any technician looking at this, would probably be able to tell that those were crowns, probably because of how uniform they look. Um, but for this patient who had a mouthful of existing restorations, I think we did a really nice service for him. Again, we bumped up the value a little bit, made it just a tiny bit brighter. And that's usually a good marketing <laughs> technique to get them to go ahead and uh, continue treatment to do, do the rest of the stuff that needs to be done. So there we are, case complete. Um, patient's very satisfied, knows that he probably be, won't be wearing down those teeth anytime soon. Um, had to make very minimal adjustments on the zirconia when we did it became highly polished so this was a combination case where we were doing you know there was some analog stuff there was some digital stuff and again somewhere right dead smack in the middle and when we are doing the digital portion of this the CAD the, the cam right there's still you still need to think about it you still need a human being to think to design these libraries to tweak the libraries to make real decisions about the case and I feel Feel like if you are letting the computer do everything for you then you are now the slave to the computer rather than using that computer for efficiency and to serve your needs okay so zirconia okay so we're talking about zirconia most of the cases i'm going to show you are either full contour zirconia or have zirconia as a core so i talked about some of the benefits right it's really strong i can do a minimal prep but what's the problem with zirconia there are definitely some inherent problems with zirconia. And the most poignant problem, the most obvious salient problem is that zirconia looks like zirconia, right? So unless you have a really good technician that understands how to make zirconia not look like zirconia, um, but yeah, it usually looks like zirconia. And here's another example. This was a patient that presented to my office. This was maybe a month ago. And um, you know, if you take a look at this, it just, it, doesn't it looks like zirconia right like even an endodontist could tell that this was zirconia and i always say you know if it looks this bad from the outside you know what do you think that looks like underneath and so you take a look at this and you know the patient wants to know <laughs> she thinks that the the restoration is broken around these implants you know she's like oh why did it break in this area where it's gray you know, and there's just so much going on with this, and that's that's hard to have that conversation because, you know, she probably spent eighty thousand dollars on, you know, ten maxillary implants and this big prosthesis, and there's just so much 
wrong with this, it'd be easier to tell her what's right about it rather than what's wrong about it. Um, you know, obviously it's very difficult to keep clean. She's got some ulcerations. If you look at the apical region above eight, nine, or like one, one, two, one. I mean, there's there's a lot going on with this, right? So, all right. So if the fact that zirconia looks like zirconia is the problem, okay, well then what is the solution? Well, one of the nice things again about working with Almond Gearbox is that they have these super high translucent zirconias available that I can, you know, it's like, for me as a, as a technician and a prosthodontist, it's like the key to the candy store. You know, when I call them and say, hey man, I really wanna try this, or they send some of these things my way to test out and they're really, really fantastic. I mean, the if you take a look on the right here, this is the Ceramel Zolid HT Zirconia. Take a look at the left, that's lithium disilicate, and this is a light just shining through. And there's really not that much difference, right? They're the same thickness, um, all factors being equal, drawn from the same library, the same tooth preparation. But look, I mean, they're, the Zirconia now has begun to approach the way that um, lithium disilicate looks. Let's see. And when you start to keep some of these things in mind, when you start to use the right materials, um, you can get restorations that look like this. Now, what you see at the bottom that looks like it's you know eight different crowns. It's the same two crowns just rotated and flipped around on a mirror, right? But when you look in the in the maxillary arch, there's two restorations there that are in place, and it matches the patient's natural dentition pretty well because we're using really nice high translucent zirconias, right? But this is a totally monolithic stained glaze and a ton of credit to my uh, ceramist who I use for this case. This was Alexander Wunsche. He's a CDT or actually nice. He's like a German master ceramic. I mean, he's really, really good. He's based out of Miami, Florida. Um, and he did this case with me and he did a, a killer job. And this was one shot. We tried it in, fit like a glove, dropped right in and it looked amazing. But the, again, the idea is, is that we're, we're selecting the right materials. I'm also sending him really good shade photos. He, we're also using a stump shade. Alex used the underlying tooth preparation, the color underneath, um, to help guide and enhance the color of the final restorations. And so that's the next thing that I want to talk about. You know, uh, tip number three: timing is everything. You know, in the stump shade acquisition, um, this is something that's amazing. How many times I go out and talk to people? Um, you know, when I'm in an audience and I say, you know. I get questions like, what, what's a stump shade? What's, what's stump shade? And I think, you know, how do you, in this day and age when we're doing minimally invasive preparations and you've got these, you know, two tenth, three tenth of a millimeter veneers, like how do you, how are you really getting those to look that great without getting the underlying tooth color just right? And so with the timing for my stump shades, I always do my stump shades at 72 hours post-op rarely will I ever do my stump shade at the time of the appointment. And the reason for that is that enamel and dentin, if we're talking about hard tissue structures, right? Everybody knows to take the shade photos, right? That you see here. This was a case that again, Luke's and I did. This was the two centrals. He's actually missing the left central incisor. That was, so this is some kind of like a resin Pontic Maryland bridge type thing. Right, so I'm taking my shade photos ahead of time, sending that to my ceramist, and we take our shade photos before we begin prepping. Why? Because the teeth dehydrate. This 1M1 that you see in this middle photo at the at the beginning of this this you know uh, preparation that I'm going to do, at the end of the day, this is going to be like an OM1. Right, the value is going to be much higher. And so if I take my shade at the end of the appointment. That's and then I send that photo to Lucas. He's going to send me a shade back that's you know like three shades brighter, and then the patient's going to be upset with me, right? So if you take a look at the far right picture here, where I'm doing the stump shade, so this is the same case, and you'll notice that we've now prepped these teeth for a bridge. We've done some adjustment to that pontic. Um, this is a healed uh, pontic site for that left central incisor. I've had that patient come back. Now I'm doing my stump shade for that. And here's how we originally started. When I prepped him the very first day, that's the, the top photo there. You can see that he had a massive, some kind of like modified ridge lap pontic going on. And now I want to have my crown look like it's emerging from the tissue. I want to build that up, right? I don't want to create a food trap. 
So during the during the appointment, I've developed that Pontic, and now you can see the one week post op in that very bottom photo, which kind of migrates over here to this right photo where I'm actually doing some shade. So I always wait a bit of time because I want my dentin to to um, be well hydrated. I don't want it to be desiccated. And now if you think about dentin versus enamel, enamel has way less moisture content than dentin does. So what do you think happens to those teeth preparations as I'm carving on them, doing a final impression, doing all this stuff? They're gonna dry out. And so your stump shade, which is dramatically impacting the, the look of the final restoration is not gonna be adequate and is not gonna be accurate on day one right after you prep. So I always provisionalize, send the patient home, have them come back three days later, check to make sure that they're flossing correctly, check to make sure that their hygiene's good, Check to make sure, you know, if they were numb when I put that provisional on, make sure that there's no adjustments that need to be made, then I'm doing my stump shade. So here's the layered zirconia frame that Lucas and I did. I think this was HT white. Um, this was a very, very strong ceramic frame. And so here's the final result from this. And it, again, it came out looking pretty nice. Um, now for here, I was unable to get a final photo with the lips retracted. This was one of our patients, again, where I am in Maine. Many of these patients come in and sometimes they're snowbirding, meaning they're going down to Florida, they're going elsewhere, they migrate. And I never ever ended up getting a chance. This was on the day of delivery. Um, he was still a little bit numb. Wanted to have him come back, you know, a couple weeks later, never saw the guy again. So I, I am a big fan of showing the retracted view. For this one, I did not have it, unfortunately. All right, so custom shade tabs. This was something else that I wanted to talk about. I think this is really important. Um, you know, a lot of people out there have seen where we have um, these different protocols for doing um, gray cards, and you take a photo in RAW, you send it to your ceramist, you use the eyedropper tool in Photoshop, and it gives you a recipe for doing a custom ceramic build, right? And there's different systems coming out now and people always want to ask me you know what, what are my thoughts about that and i've done it a few times and i'll and it works well you know but it, there's a little bit of a learning curve to it the learning curve i think for that is, is a little bit more shallow than these companies would like you to think meaning it you have to you have to spend some time with it to get it just right um for the time being shade tabs aren't going anywhere shade tabs will be around for a long time because I feel like the people who are doing these um, computer-based systems where they're using the eyedropper tool and photographs and cross-polarized photography to like get the shade, that represents really a fraction of a fraction of a percent of the dentists and technicians that are out there. Um, so for the time being, I'll show you what I think works really well for most people. So here's this patient, she comes in, this is the way that uh, you know she initially looks. And you know, folks see this and they think, oh my gosh, I am going to do a full mouth rehabilitation on this patient. But the truth of the matter is, is this patient really just wanted that front tooth replaced. Um, doesn't want to do an implant. She's got some apprehensions about surgery. Here she is from the posterior. Obviously you see she's missing some premolars on the right side. Again, she really does not want to do any surgical procedures. She has, she's getting surgery on her knees. She, you know, doesn't want to get those infected, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, I'm here to serve the patient. So what we do is before we even start prepping the teeth, we do a quick wax up. And now again, I, I did this, this is my wax up. It was eh, quick, rapid. I mean, we're talking, I had diagnostic models of her, made something really quick for her in the chair, made a bisacryl. So this is um, GC's TempSmart that I use. And now I can, because we're doing an additive technique, I can just build this up really quick in the mouth, stain and glaze this with a little Opti glaze. And now I take a photo of this, send it to Lucas and say, hey man, what do you think? And he says, hey, that looks pretty close. So where I've stained on that central incisor, the root tip, and this is really, again, this isn't for aesthetics or cosmetics or anything. This is just so that I can have a customized shade tab. Now what I do is I wiggle this off. Once I get it pretty close, I send that to Lucas and now it becomes a paint by number. Now this is very, very helpful if your ceramist is like in another country, in another state, the other side of the state, like out of town for a while. You can send them a customized shade tab because for this case, 
I mean, what shade tab would I really have used to communicate the color of that that cervical region, that neck, that kind of amber, honey, canary color? I don't know, whatever you want to call that. How do you, I don't, I don't know, I don't have a shade tab that would have matched this. And so once I've got that shade tab in place, I mean, so here, for example, is my Vita linear guide and it's close-ish. So I'm showing my ceramics and I say, hey, here's a 3R 1.5 that is kind of close to her natural tooth and based on the shade that i use my custom shade which is some proprietary blend of brown dark blonde, brown pink orange and white you know all kind of mixed together whatever i had on my my stain palette for my temporary right it's again i can't communicate that because those shades and those colors for that optiglaze don't translate to the gc ceramic or vita ceramic or whatever ceramic your uh, technician is going to use so again now they have that temporary that I send along with the case and I just make the patient a brand new one really quick it doesn't cost much and now he's got to paint my number and so this was a question that came up all the time and again I do not speak for Vita at all but this is the shade guide that I highly recommend for everybody it's super easy to use this is the value guide 3d master um, and it's the closest match to natural human dentition and that's in the literature and again I can provide you guys with publications to that if you want to look at it and so another question comes up like, all right, man, like, you know, technicians especially say, hey, I've got the, I recognize, you know, the value of this Vita shade guide, that 3D master, but what if the dentist I'm working with, or, you know, what if the other technicians that I'm communicating with, what if they only have the Vita classic guide, which everybody has, everybody probably has like three of these in their office or their laboratory. Well, there is a conversion chart and here's the conversion chart. I have this chair side printed out in like a three and a half inch by two and a half inch, like little card and I've laminated it. So here's the conversion. It's really, really helpful. Um, you know, and there's times where I even need to do this, and this is especially helpful. So I see that that last patient had a 3R 1.5, but unfortunately, most of the companies that make your temporary materials still make them as A1, A2, C3, right? So I still need to know what that translates to into the Vita Classic Guide for my everyday use. All right. Less is more. Now, this is a philosophy that I really, really agree with. Um, and, you know, when I was in my residency, we um, we tended to really, I feel, over prep our teeth. The teeth the preps were, were really deep, really, really aggressive. And I don't know, maybe that's an American thing. Maybe it's a army prosthodontist thing. I'm not sure. But it took me some time, you know, and again, some long discussions with my ceramist about hey you know this is really how we need to do this um i saw like what worked over time and, you know and it takes I, as creatures of habit most dentists are creatures of habit most technicians too we tend to go with what we know um so but these these items here for me tend to be a part of my everyday practice now for tooth preparations bite registration ceramic inventory and the cements that i'm using all right, so tooth preparations for zirconia. And again, uh, we kind of went through this before that, you know, one of the things that I really like about these zirconia preparations is that they can be really, really minimal. So if you look at these two preps over here on the left that are in color, you can have a knife edge prep. You know, sometimes uh, there's been a lot of talk about the biologically oriented preparation technique or the BOPT technique um, by Loy and DeFelice. You know, this technique has actually been out for, you know, 40 years probably you know i think they were doing this in europe way back in the day when we were doing a lot of metal ceramic you could have essentially a marginless prep for that metal you could finish the metal down really really easily once we started getting into you know feldspathic ceramic and lucite reinforced and lithium disilic you know we had to kind of change our preparation designs a little bit you know we go to more like a deep chamfer where they wanted a millimeter or more for the margins now with with zirconia i'm either doing like almost like a, a marginless prep like 0.1 millimeter to like maybe 0.3 maybe like a shallow chamfer um so that's typically what i'm doing and again it's much more conservative so if you take a look at the preparations here i mean there's really really not much of a margin to these i mean it just sort of disappears under the gingiva um again i want to keep this like really really conservative and again on the less is more <laughs> topic while we're talking about it Docs, for any of the docs listening, if your technician tells you you need to reduce again, reduce again. Again, this is for your benefit. 
And you know, if you're prepping enough teeth, if you've never seen a reduction coping, um, you know, you probably need to find a new laboratory because <laughs> if your crowns are coming back and they're bulky, um, really, this is something that I found to be very, very helpful. Fortunately, Lucas doesn't have to make too many of these for me, but in my attempts to keep as conservative a tooth preparation as possible, um, this just happens sometimes. So for this case, Lucas just told me, he's like, hey man, I really just need a little bit more taken off of that crown. Doesn't mean that you need to re-impress the crown. And Lucas just used, uh, this is from Harvest Dental, he uses this little pattern resin, creates a coping that snaps on over the top of the crown, or the tooth preparation rather, you can see, in this photograph, there's like a little half millimeter of incisal edge poking out of that window at the bottom. All I do is just take an ultra fine diamond burr and just zip like once across. And now the framework that he's made will now fit on top of that. So for the doctors out there that have never heard of a reduction coping, don't know what I'm talking about, contact your lab technician to ask them to explain it to you. Again, there's just not enough time really in this webinar to go over that, but that is something that I use um, often. Enough. <laughs> I mean, not, let's not say often. I use it enough. Um, all right. Bite registration. This is an intraoral bite registration. And every technician that's watching this probably has a laboratory full of case pans that have these horseshoe shaped, you know, full arch bite registrations in there. This type of bite registration is really pretty useless. You know, so again, when I was in the army and these doctors would give me, these dentists would give me you know, a, a final impression of the maxilla and the mandible, and we're restoring like a single premolar and they give me a bite registration like this. It's almost like they were saying to me, here, man, you throw this out. You know, and so I came up with creative uses for these bite registrations. You know, sometimes I guess you could use it as like a placeholder, as like a bookmark, you know, so I have that. Um, I found that it works really well as like a shoehorn. <laughs> you know, you could play you know, it's like almost like a boomerang. I mean, you could play, you could do a lot of different things with this, anything but use it as a bite registration. And again, if you don't understand why this is not adequate, um, I'll briefly explain it. Basically, if you have an alginate impression, even though alginate is a pretty, you know, accurate material to use for an impression, the pits and the grooves that come out on that cast and that type three gypsum that I showed you in the very beginning of this presentation, you know, how nice that looks, it's not as accurate as the silicone that you're using to make that bite registration. So if you look in here where I'm holding onto this green bite registration, you know all the little, see all the little fins and grooves? Those are so deep and so razor sharp and accurate, they cannot fit adequately and accurately into the alginate cast that I have. Okay, so now when I use this bite registration to mount my cast, I'm opening the bite. And so what happens now is if the lab technician mounts that case with this bite registration, which is absolutely ridiculous, now the crown will inevitably be, you know, a couple tenths of a millimeter taller than it needs to. So if you've ever sat there grinding a tooth down for 20 minutes and you erase all the anatomy, it's primarily because of stuff like this. So less is more. So the way that I do my bite registrations when I do them would look something like this. So here's the pre-op photo on the left. Here's the preps in the middle. Now, if you take a look at the left-hand situation, look where his canines are. Notice that gap between his canines. So this guy's in MIP. So when you see him in that central photo, this is still MIP. This is an unusual bite. So he has no anterior coupling. So for a case like this, I'm doing a bite registration that is essentially just covering the preps. This patient contacts on his molars on the left and right, and now this little bite registration is essentially creating a tripod that helps the laboratory mount this case, but that's it. I do not need or do not want a full arch bite registration. All right, so moving on from that. Streamlining your materials. Now, this is something I did um, always with my um, Bisacryls, right? My Temp Smarts, your um, temporary materials, you know, that are like auto mix, like catalyst, base and catalyst that are syringable, right? I will keep, for my patients, I will keep an A1 or a B1 shade, maybe even like a bleach. I'll, I'll keep one of those typically on hand. And the idea is, is that I will now keep that and then stain down from a bleach shade or a B1. I can get to any other shade on that Vita linear guide 
right? I can get to, uh, uh, from a bleach shade, I can get to a 1M2. I can get to a 2M2. I can get to a 3M2. I can work my way backwards if I start with a higher value shade. The same is true for your ceramic. If you keep only a few pucks in your laboratory that are really high value, like, yeah, like a B1 or an A1, for example, you can get to a C2 from an A1. You can get to a D2 from an A1. And it just, it makes the whole process that much more streamlined and it makes it that much easier. So if you take a look, these are essentially the same ceramic, right? The ceramic on the right, this coping that you see here on the right, I can get to the shade on the left or my ceramics can get to that shade on the left just with a little staining and glazing, right? It's really, really easy. So. Again, I keep a high value, low chroma zirconia or high value, low chroma resin or bisacryl on hand because I can go the other way. If you start with, a, with an A3, you can't get to a B1 or not without significant effort. And so again, now when you see this, the layering process, Lucas is gonna use higher value ceramics to kind of offset the color of that that dark, very highly chromatic zirconia now to get to a place where we want to be for the final restoration. And now in this less is more philosophy for the cementation of these crowns, whenever I'm doing zirconia, I never use a self-adhesive cement. It's too damn sticky. It's difficult to clean. I'm always going to use a resin modified glass ionomer cement. In this case, I'm using something like Fuji. Everybody knows what Fuji is. Right, you can really use any cement. It just makes for a really easy cleanup. And I'm putting just enough cement in there that I just wanna see a little bead on a couple aspects of the crown. So if you look at the crown, that would be number seven, or I guess it would be one, two. Notice there's a couple little areas where that's oozing out. It's not oozing out 360 degrees around that restoration. Same thing if you look at tooth number nine or two one, there's just a thin little donut that just peeks its head out there and I'm gonna tack cure that, right? Depending on the resin modified glass ionomer that you have, some of them are light cured, some are not, or you can tack cure. So I'll tack cure that for about three seconds and then just peel that off and it's a piece of cake. And that's the final result that we have. This is at the time of delivery and you notice how nice her gingiva looks, right? And I didn't have to like go digging around with that cement, you know, underneath the gum line underneath the gingiva so now I can get my final photo in case this patient never decides to come back. She's got a very high smile line. Um, and this was a really nice result. And again, you know, I'm just gluing the thing up. <laughs> this is all credit to my ceramics. This is like really, really nice. All right, you guys, thank you very, very much. Again, I kept you a little bit longer than I wanted to, but again, I just wanted to hit a couple of key topics, um, a couple of key things that I go through as, as a technician, as a ceramist that I've learned from my technician, um, that I've learned through a lot of experience, just some clinical nuggets that I think are helpful day to day that I wish I knew long ago.